and a contributor <laughs> to the volume devoted to furniture in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, uh, being published later this year as part of the multi-volume Cultural History of Furniture to be published by Bloomsbury, to which we look forward greatly. So it gives me great pleasure now to hand over to Chris uh, and for his paper, A Closer Look at a Group of English Clamped Chests, Timber Construction and Decoration. Uh, over to you, Chris. Hey, thank you very much indeed, uh, Nick. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and uh, cover this topic. Uh, West Sussex group uh, will come to them eventually. But I, what I wanted to do is for people who uh, are not terribly interested in medieval chess to try and encourage your interest by uh, giving you a bit of an introduction to see how everything fits together. So it'll be a bit of an introduction and then we'll, we'll go into the main talk. Uh, firstly, I think it's important to try and uh, sort out what's meant by the different construction types. So I think most Chris, people are aware... Sorry to interrupt you. You need to maximise your screen. You're not on slideshow yet. Ah, OK. Thanks. Uh, You're sharing it, but it's not maximised. Chris, you can press F5, I think. F5, OK. That's it. Is it working? Yeah. Oh, OK. I'll get rid of that. OK. Right. So, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the different types of uh, uh, construction. Uh, so the dugout construction, I think, is fairly well understood. Uh, this is simply a, a block of the trunk uh, carved, uh, sides carved off, and then uh, recessed cut, and then a, a lid added on, usually with a strap hinge. This is an example from Sussex in Suffolk, the awning in Suffolk, dated late 12th century, based on the ironwork. Uh, <clears throat> then the second type, and this is by far the most common type, is, uh, is the boarded construction, sometimes known as a six plank construction, because it has two ends and top, back and sides, two top, back and front and back. And as you can see, this is a, a weak sort of structure, which always needs support around the base and around the corners, because the corner joints are, if you didn't have the iron strap work, you, you'd simply have uh, nails or pegs which actually this one does have, but they haven't been sufficient. So it's got all sorts of extras. So the, today, uh, of medieval chess, this probably accounts for about 85 to 90%. <clears throat> and if you go into a church uh, in England with a medieval chess, this is probably what you'll see. <clears throat> uh, a slightly more advanced type of chess is uh, advanced in the sense of mixing types of construction is this chest which is actually found in Kent, this particular one, which is a mixture of boarded construction of the base, the, uh, which has the five planks. And then the top, the lid, is, as you can see from the right hand image, is uh, hollowed out, in this case from lime wood, and this has been dendro dated 1390 to 1420. And the pine has been provenance to the uh, Baltic area. Uh, so this is a shows that construction methods can combine. Uh, the third sort is the sort that uh, <coughs> Cecile has already introduced, clamp construction, where you have these, in this case, a single uh, board front, uh, which <coughs> tenons into uh, these two uprights or the styles. And then they're attached by wooden pegs, which in this case are capped over with iron caps, which originally probably would have been uh, shiny, and the shine is obviously gone. 
you've also got some iron uh, discs and the iron uh, escutcheon. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking about plain chests uh, as one type. I'm, I'm counting this as a plain chest because the facade is plain, although uh, the feet are certainly not plain, and the feet are with the subject are, are the subject of another article of mine. So, uh, but when I talk about decorated and plain, this will count as a plain one. <clears throat> uh, the, the point about these, I uh, just show how the uh, <coughs> the front is uh, joined to the uh, the styles. You can see this uh, very deep uh, shaped groove that goes from top to bottom, and the uh, the front board or boards in some cases are pegged into that. And uh, <coughs> the interesting thing is that the shape of the style in plan view is always uh, <coughs> uh, this wedge shape. And but the actual joint can be different. Uh, and I've given you two examples here. You've got the, the case where on the left, where the <coughs> the shape of the tenon is constant. And some people would say this isn't really a tenon at all because it's not shaped in the way tenon joints usually are, what <coughs> tenons usually are. On the other hand, uh, on the right hand side, you can't see uh, the the board once the once it enters into the uh, into the front board, and this is because the joint has been made with a shoulder. So, so this is, if you like, a more sophisticated version. And the strange thing is that it's the joint on the right, which is the joint on the chest, which has the earliest dendro date in Kent, which is 1237 to 1260, I think, offhand. So it's, it's, it indicates that even the chest of that date has a really quite sophisticated feature. <laughs> so the interesting thing about these chest types is that uh, the clamp chest is uh, a rare type, and today they constitute about 5% or less, uh, probably much less, of, of uh, medieval chest. And on the other hand, so that's, uh, all of these chest types were existent between 1200 and 1500. The question of what happened before that, uh, I mean, we, we've, got, we've ha had examples today already of chests before 1200, and certainly my, my judgment is that well, in, in the West, in Western Strabi, there's a clamp chest uh, which dates to the late 12th century. And I'm sure that there were chests before that of this type, because simply the quality of the workmanship is so high that you can't imagine this wasn't the case of someone trying to invent something and making a bodged job of, job of it. It's, it's someone working from a well established tradition. And similarly, I think uh, uh, <coughs> clamp chests, sorry, no, in dugout chests go back a long way, and uh, boarded chests also. How far forward they go is, is a debatable question, but on the continents, you find clamp chests in rural France in the 18th century still, whereas in, in England, they stop around 1500 in the Welsh borders with some unusual sorts of joints where they go on till about 1700. So it's a, it's a sort of chest which, uh, <laughs> If you like, it's the, the one that's died out clearly, whereas the dugout chests, they go on until 1700 as well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, firstly, I wanted to say a word about the knowledge base uh, in this area, because <clears throat> in a way, a lot of my most motivation was dissatisfaction with what I was reading and the feeling that, uh, you know, what one tended to end up with earlier and earlier books, which were larger and larger, more and more heavy, and therefore obviously more authoritative. But as soon as you started probing, you found that there wasn't very much to the, the actual uh, basis of the knowledge. And already Cecile has referred to stylistic dating as one of the problems, that dating things by the style of architecture uh, turns out not to be a reliable guide. This was thought at that time. <clears throat> so I'll just run through them very quickly. They're all quite well known. Fredero is a, a large book. He'd seen a lot of chess. He'd been to the continent. And some of them were fakes. But it, it's quite a nice chapter 
century by century introduction. Philip Johnson, very influential person in the early days, he did a big survey of chess, which he designated as course in 13th century. Well, I think today we wouldn't agree with most of those dates, but he was probably 50 to 100 years too early in his date. <clears throat> uh, but it's a very useful reference point for anyone working in this area. Then there's a study of church chests of Essex, which is very useful because it has drawings of all of them and measurements <clears throat> and a very good introduction. Penelope Eames book, if you see it up for sale, buy it because it's hard to find now. And it, it covers French, uh, Flemish, and uh, uh, <clears throat> English chests. No, furniture of all sorts up to 1500. Very, very thorough studies, huge documentary basis. Jane Geddes, who hopefully be with us, but we'll see this later, I hope, wrote the definitive book on decorative ironwork, which has a very large number of chess pictures as well. So it's very instructive. And uh, all the time that work's being built on. The book by Karl Heinrich von Stuttnagel. Again, we've already seen chess from that uh, study in Lüneburg. It's a study of uh, chess in uh, nunneries, uh, which date from the 13th and 14th century. And the amount of detail in that is greater than in any other study of early chess. So, if, again, it's hard to get hold of because they didn't print enough copies, but uh, it's well worth getting hold of. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Dan Miles and Martin Bridge's study of Westminster Abbey chest is definitive. You can download it from the English Heritage uh, website. Then they did a nice overview of gender data chest in our journal, which is on the website. David Sherlock's Suffolk book has lots of photos and is a very, very useful, useful book. And the, uh, the Swiss uh, study from Valley History Museum. Again, we've seen examples of that already from there, uh, just from there, uh, and it's an excellent study. And in terms of general background, I always find Eric Mercer's book, uh, you know, he wrote very widely, but this book on furniture is completely European in coverage. Adam Bowick's book on woods, it's really like three books in one. It's about the timber trade, it's about all the types of wood ever used, uh, and the furniture that it was used for. And then finally, Bruce Campbell's wonderful book on uh, the medieval period, uh, which he's an economic historian, but he integrates everything from uh, climate trends to pandemics. He, he publishes it all too early to sell well at the moment, I'm afraid, uh, and bringing it right down to the demographic and economic trends in European countries. So it's, it's a, a tour de force, really. <clears throat> now, if you go on to the, <clears throat> say, word <clears throat> in more, more substance about the, the knowledge base, the, the, types of, the types of research that have been done can be divided into three sorts. Uh, county county studies like uh, David Sherlock's, uh, which are very useful because they, they slice the data up, as it were, in that particular way. Institutional studies like the Westminster Abbey, the Lunenburg Heath Nunneries, and uh, the Valor History Museum studies. Again, they take uh, chests which have ended up in a particular sort of place, a particular type of institution, and that can help. Uh, explain their specificity. And then typological studies are ones that take a particular type of chest, don't worry about where they're found, and just follow them and try and build a base uh, by uh, gradual accretion. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> these have been the three types. They, they all have their pros and cons. And uh, I, I think this to the second, the last type, the typological type, uh, and I'll show some pictures of those in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> in the 1970s, the, the big step forward in the study of medieval chess was through the rise of endocrinology. Uh, today, as you've seen already, it's, it's amazingly widely used. And what it enables one to do is to date. So if you're lucky and it doesn't always work, 
but if you're lucky, to date and provenance of timber uh, in the object of study. Uh, the big discovery in the 1980s was the discovery that not all timber in England, for example, was English timber. And the discovery of the import of Baltic timber, which had been recorded, of course, historically, uh, and the fi actually finding the, tim the objects in which it was used uh, meant that uh, a lot of study had, had to be reinterpreted. Uh, <clears throat> so, as, as you know, it, the process works by comparing uh, tree ring growth patterns, uh, increasing and decreasing from year to year. Uh, with established patterns from other sources, and uh, from that matching the uh, timber with previous timber. Uh, <clears throat> there are some limitations for uh, timber technology, and uh, one of them is that sometimes the oak, for example, is too fast grown. Uh, and it doesn't allow the endocrinologists to uh, obtain the three, three rings that they need. Sometimes the chronologies are simply not available. You can only compare with what's been uh, sampled. And if you're in the part of the country uh, where not many samples are being made, then it's, you're limited in comparisons you can make. Uh, the question of var variation in growing conditions between uh, locations. If the variations are not huge, and in quite large chunks of southern England, you find you know, broadly similar sorts of weather, uh, then that's going to affect the differentiation between the growth patterns in those areas. Uh, the question of the sapwood that's often cut off in, in the case of furniture making, uh, since that's part of the growth pattern, if you don't have the sapwood, then you have to make an estimation. And you'll notice that when uh, uh, when Cecile was giving her results from uh, endocrinology, she was say, giving a single date and saying 1270. Whereas in, in the UK, what the way the dating is done, then Gent gives you either uh, a range, the felling dates range, when it's estimated the uh, the timber was uh, felled, or else a, a date after which a terminus post quem, an earlier state for the timber. And there are obviously ways of working between a single point estimate, which might be the, the peak of a normal curve, for example, and the sort of ranges which uh, tends to be used in the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the final problem is that. Sometimes you find a mixture of timber that's not original in what, what's an original piece of uh, what was thought to be an original chest. And again, uh, Cecil gave some examples of this. Uh, to move on to uh, the sorts of knowledge coming from secondary sources, uh, my categories here are firstly edicts. Uh, historical documents will give you a statement saying that Henry II, Henry II in 1166 and Pope Innocent III in 1199 required churches to have a chest to take money for the Crusades. Uh, and then it had to have three locks in the latter case. Or in 1308, Pope Clement required cathedrals and parish churches to have arms chests also with three locks. But the problem is that if you find a chest with three locks, can you infer that it that comes from the state? Well, obviously the answer is you can't. Uh, it would be a, a, quite a, a, a lucky chance if, if you did find one that had survived with three locks. The, uh, the three lock requirement was something that has been uh, enunciated at many points since. And I, I should say most of the cases where you find three locks, they, that they date from much, much later. So that, that's, that's an indication of the sort of potential knowledge, but difficulty in application that you find. Second uh, type of uh, basis of knowledge is uh, the increasing value of church furnishings. If you look at the development of churches, you find that uh, in the 1250 to 1300 period, there's a very large increase in the volume of 
uh, church furnishings, particularly around altars. And this was in the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, uh, which adopted the doctrine of transubstantiation. The main altar became a much more important uh, symbolic place and a whole series of extra uh, accoutrements and vestments uh, were needed to celebrate mass. And uh, this led to uh, a lot of increase in valuables, also to the rebuilding of chancels, the addition of nave aisles, chantry chapels too. Uh, this was also a period of economic and population growth. So you had uh, donors, central donors, who could afford to uh, give uh, objects to the church. And, uh, and partly as a, an expression of social status, perhaps, and also as, as an uh, expression of a desire for salvation. Uh, so it got to the point where in 1287, the Exeter Synod created the role of church warden and required that churches provide chests for books and vestments. And it's praised just um, uh, Libros et, et Vestimenta is something you find in many sources at that time. By the way, my, my Latin is schoolboy, so I don't read these in, in the original. Uh, so th this gives you a sense of the second half of the 13th century as being a very important period for uh, the demand for storage in, in churches. Uh, a third source is inventories. Well, th again, this is this is very useful. And Ella Beams is probably the person who's made most use of uh, inventories. Uh, they're useful for discussing for describing the contents of ch chests. They can also be useful for studying aspects of the chest, what timber it's made of, whether it's Danster or some other country, what colour it is, whether it's old whether it has ironwork, description of the locks. But it's quite rare to find cases where uh, both the chest uh, contents and the chest description are, are combined. So most of the time we're not having to deal with one or the other. Clearly the, the most secular and ecclesiastical types of chests, and the ones that end up in churches today, of course, may have started life as secular chests. And it's the churches are the sort of place that people feel that chests are called chests that are out of fashion belonging. And so they tend to be a typical gift. Uh, in churches, the typical uses of chests of chests were for storing arms, money for crusades, vestments, uh, books, archives, valuables of all sorts, altar accoutrements, front doors, chalices, censers, fixes, candlesticks, processional crosses, relics. There was an idea that uh, chests uh, near to altars should be kept near to altars to store the accoutrements nearby. Uh, so that can be a useful source. And in uh, Norwich, the Norwich area in the early 14th century, there's a very good rec uh, record of all the, all the churches and the contents of all the chests, which is wonderful. Uh, inventory, uh, sorry, accounts. Well, any sort of account, whether it's church wardens' accounts or even buildings, if the building account can give valuable information about uh, timber and about uh, addition of locks, you know, repairs, etc. Last but not least, images of chess. Again, we've, we've seen some already today. Uh, we'll have pictures of, 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 of chess and sometimes their contents, usually in colour, uh, which can, can be helpful. Obviously, there are problems with dating because images could be reproduced over time. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that's another source of material on chests. As far as the, <clears throat> uh, the, the results of these studies are, uh, in the pre-1970 period, the, the studies that were done uh, <clears throat> tended to base dates on edicts. Now they choose an edict and say, well, this must be a crusader chest because this is when the money was being collected for the crusades, or based on the age of the church, uh, on the basis of the chest was there from when the church was built. The style of the carving, and there's the idea of construction technology that if it was a, uh, a dugout chest, it must be 
pre-conquest, and you'll find this in churches today that are uh, noted for saying very confidently that dugout chests are the ancient, most ancient sort imaginable. Uh, the appearance of very worn looking chests like the Klimping chest in Chichester Cathedral is often attributed a very, very early date simply because it, it's really had such a hard life. Um, and certainly the illustrations of dubious examples tend to authorize uh, dating for decades and centuries afterwards. <laughs> Uh, the other point about the early studies is they very, very much underestimated imported chests. They tend to think that if a chest was in England, it was an English chest. And I think this is one thing where we've uh, progressed a little bit. Uh, the, the present position is that we have a new wave of recording since the 1970s uh, using dendrochronology and a very detailed examination of construction, decoration, and ironwork and being aware of European movement of chess and the idea of traveling objects, as the art historians use the phrase. And just as an example of this, and since Gavin Simpson's uh, face is on my screen, uh, Gavin will recognize this, uh, <coughs> uh, this map as he, he has it drawn. And this is a map of the medieval pine chests, which are the ones I, I showed earlier with the domed lid. Uh, and the dendrochronology on these shows the pine came from uh, <clears throat> the Baltic area, and they all coincided around about 1390 to 1420. And when you analyze the, the details, the types of ironwork, the types of uh, joint, uh, the types of hinge, the types of nail, uh, every detail of them corresponded to chests of the same sort you could find in Poland today or in Germany. And there was lots of evidence from the uh, <clears throat> uh, port records of the uh, transport of chests. And it, it seemed quite reasonable, given the, uh, the eastward magnetic trend of those uh, chests, that uh, uh, these were indeed imported chests. <clears throat> and one other, one other example. <clears throat> I had a preview of this earlier, thanks to Nick. This is the, uh, <clears throat> the Faversham chest. And again, this was when first written about in 1909. <clears throat> this was described as an example of Kentish Gothic work. And uh, the fact there was one down the road at Raymond uh, supported that. And another one in Canterbury <clears throat> made it certain. Well, even in those days, uh, one of, the ex one of the specialists realized there was one at uh, <clears throat> Laneham in Norfolk. And then since then, two more have been found. And I've seen a picture of four. And again, when, when these have been dendrodated, they've shown exactly the same source. It's, uh, it's uh, Baltic oak, <clears throat> and it's from uh, the Baltic, from that same area. From in, in exactly that same period, 1390 to 1420. And this is a rare case where you can see uh, polychromy. Unfortunately, chess hadn't received a lot of attention by specialists in polychrome. And I think this would be a great opportunity to study this type of chess. I should say that according to the Dictionary of, early, early, of English Furniture, this is a chess made up of boards going across from side to side. Well, you can actually see, even in the photo in the dictionary, uh, that there are styles here. And the, the decoration goes on over the style. The only additional feature here is there's an applied uh, board that goes right along the top of the chest with the heads of the uh, arches. And that's applied right across and gives extra strengthening as well as giving depth to the arches. So again, uh, by very, very careful matching of these chests, and I should say the lid is decorated, which is very, very unusual in English chests. And again, the decoration matches exactly uh, decoration shown in the Stuttmayer book, uh, showing the German chest. Uh, by the way, this chest, unfortunately, is only a lid and a, a facade. The rest of it is a, a time structure that keeps it all together, but we should be grateful it survives. 
So this is really an indication of, that we are making a bit of progress in uh, identifying imported chests. I should say the job isn't done, and there are lots of chests, particularly uh, there's a 40, probably a 14th century type with uh, trace in the main part and uh, reserves with mythical beasts are at the left hand and right hand end on the styles that could be imported, but no one's really studied them sufficiently. And I think the eastern coast of England is most likely to be the place where you will find uh, imported chests. But uh, anyway, so there's lots of work to do. Well, coming on <coughs> to a, a definition of what I want to talk about. <coughs> uh, firstly, clamp construction uh, is, is, as we, we defined that already, uh, I'll, I'll just use, use the focus. This, this is Sharp Cathedral. You can see uh, a man on the left uh, with a tool that enables you to cut out that groove into which the, uh, uh, the boards of the front of the chest uh, fit. You can see a half-made chest on the right-hand side there. Uh, this is a typical size of one of these chests, what we call an applied grid, which gives e extra strength. You can find these chests with a plain side. It doesn't mean one thing or the other, it doesn't mean it's earlier or later, it's just different. Uh, the main thing in, in this uh, lid, in this picture, is that the pin hinge is shown, at least from the outside. But the, underneath the lid, you've got this chamfer jar uh, <coughs> batten, and you can see the uh, hem at the front. And it hinges on a, an iron rod, which is concealed under this triangular shaped uh, uh, iron uh, plate. And every one of these chests has the, these iron plates over the, the, <coughs> the hinge. Uh, <coughs> uh, this is looking at the hinge from a slightly different view. And again, the till uh, is shown there, sometimes with a single till, sometimes with a hidden lower till. Uh, <coughs> this is a, an inside view. And the point here is that. Uh, the joints here have have V edges. Uh, this is what French called kinds of layers, uh, uh, barley shape. Uh, with this male and female V that makes up a continuous surface. And the surface is incredibly smooth. Uh, another type of joint is the doweled, uh, straight sided joints. They were that each board has a straight side. Uh, then a word about the, <clears throat> the bolt type. In the Sussex and Kent <coughs> chests, almost all have a particular sort of sliding bolt, which is very long, and it has these uh, prongs on. Uh, the prongs uh, engage with the staples, which are held rigidly uh, into the lid. That only breaks down when they start wearing and they start moving around because that, that defeats the whole purpose of the, uh, the lock. And that eventually happens. Those uh, prongs, uh, sorry, that those uh, staples fall into those uh, slots in the uh, this wooden cover, which goes over the, the long bolt. And uh, the long bolt itself is concealed under this uh, cover. Uh, what, what I've never discovered is whether this cover is also acts as a channel to help direct the movement of the bolt. Uh, that remains to be seen. So, <clears throat> uh, what I want to show first is the distribution of these chests. Uh, I'm sorry about the crudeness of this map, but <clears throat> this shows you county by county, county where these chests are. They're actually. <clears throat> I've got a list of 56 chests. I, I've, I'm not saying that there aren't others, but there are some others, some which I haven't had a chance to look at, uh, some of which may be pin hinged, but may not be. And you can see that the main aim of this map is to show the tendency of them to, to be concentrated in the southeast, uh, very wide southeast area. Of the uh, 56, uh, 
30, uh, 20, 21 of them have some sort of decoration on the facade. And the first number there is the 811 means that in West Sussex, there are 11 Pin Hinge tap chests, eight of which have some decoration, whereas in East Sussex, there are none. So you can see the decorated ones are very much in uh, East Sussex and Kent. It just happens that I live in Kent. Now, you might think it's some sort of observer bias, but I don't think it, it may be a bit of observer bias going further north and west. But when you get to Shropshire and West Midlands, you find some very different joints. And uh, I think what you find in East Anglia and uh, uh, points further north is more of the clamp chest. Well, there are clamp chests there, but they tend to have iron strap hinges more often. So it's more uh, different types coming in as you move north. Uh, <clears throat> right, so now just to show you the type of decoration that we won't be looking at. This is the earliest uh, of the Canterbury chests. Uh, this is what I call incised Gothic arcading. You'll see there's an absolute miniature roundel there. And all of the six Kent chests with this type of, uh, of this uh, type have this uh, arcading in some shape or form. Uh, this is the odd man out in Norfolk, the Hindringham chest, which uh, is the only one of its sort. And we've now had that gender dated uh, quite recently by Martin and Zhang. And it came out rather surprisingly as the third quarter of the 13th century. You know, the paper in uh, the latest journal copy of regional furniture goes into this in some depth. So uh, you can have a look at that. Uh, what I want to do really is to look at the Sussex uh, nearby chests. And I'll just go through them quite quickly so you know what we're talking about. So this is a picture of the chest, which is now in uh, uh, Chichester Cathedral. Uh, today, it's lost its honeycomb feet. It's also uh, lost its base. And it's in, it's in a dreadful shape, uh, which has led people to think it was incredibly early. And uh, I think the early date that was put on it was about 1220 or 12.30. Gender technology came up with this date. This is the terminus, terminus post quem date, leading to construction date of that first quarter of the 14th century. So this was, so this is a, a chest which is always described as a crusader chest, but uh, it really would have missed the boat for crusades. This is a Buxted chest. This is the only one still surviving there. There's an arch. Uh, and you can see it's got uh, arcading, Gothic arcading uh, on the feet as well, and small roundels. The Winchester Cathedral chest, uh, you've got four quite small roundels. It's lost its feet, fortunately. Uh, it's a cathedral chest. Again, we've got the dendro date for this, which uh, turned out to be rather earlier than was previously thought. There's lots of decoration on the feet. And from the next picture, you can see, well, at least I can see, some people claim they can't see this, uh, alternating red and yellow polychrome in the rays of the star and also in the, the border rings now. Um, <clears throat> this is a plain chest at Bosom which is a very fine chest with some extra uh, iron work to keep it together. Um, this is the V&A's chest, which comes from Hampshire. Uh, we don't quite know where. This is about a meter wide, one meter 10 wide. It's a very small chest, but with a very, very large round. Um, this is a rather sad chest in Laneham in Nottinghamshire, which again has three round doors. It's the only one to have uh, original ironwork, this split curl style we saw uh, in France earlier this morning. Uh, and we'll come back to that. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the, the greatest of the chests in terms of decoration, it's Earl Stonham. So you've got a wall des design here, you've got uh, hexafoil with a uh, Double uh, border, dog tooth border. 
and you've got single dog, dog tooth borders with what I call intersecting uh, hexafoils and sort of inter, inter trunk, uh, what's the word, uh, one uh, triangle uh, uh, on top of another. So you've got incredibly intricate designs coming along there. Uh, and this is the largest chest of the lot in long stanton, not in a very wonderful condition. It's got two identical uh, roundels, uh, 37 centimeters tall. And these styles are, I think, uh, 48 centimeters wide. They're quite enormous. Uh, and the, the style, the roundels don't exactly coincide because one's slightly at an angle from the other for some reason. So that's that's what I mean by rounded chest. What I want to do finally is to to really ask five questions about these chests. Firstly, can one say they form a group? We've already seen that uh, a lot of them are concentrated in uh, uh, Sussex and uh, Sussex, Surrey, uh, Hampshire, and uh, uh, yeah, Sussex, Surrey, and Hampshire. Uh, it would be these odd ones in Cambridgeshire, Suffolk, and Nottinghamshire. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is to, uh, again, go back to Johnston. What Johnston argued was that uh, based on drawings, photos, and roundels, uh, he felt they were, a great portion of them were made at the same time and probably by the same guild of chess makers. And this pointed to some special purpose having arisen to bring them into existence. And then he, he then reveals the special purpose with the Crusades. So you know, he, he assembles his data, he, he looks at historical evidence and comes to that conclusion. Uh, and can one really accept this? Well, you might guess what my conclusion is. Uh, the question of whether they're made in, in the same location is complex because uh, you can see that from those, that, that quick view I've given you of those chests, there's quite a variation uh, in the decoration. Uh, if I went into all the internals, again, I could show a lot of, a lot of variation. And in a moment, we'll see something about the size of the variations. Uh, so it wasn't the case of a, sort of a standard product being made repeatedly. Uh, there's a lot of variation between them. Uh, there have been some attempts at dating. Uh, David Sherlock's, unfortunately, his attempt to date or style didn't work. They got a, uh, a chronology, but it didn't match any known chronology. Uh, Gavin Simpson and I commissioned the uh, Lanham chest to be dated. I mean, the reason that was of interest was that. I thought, given that we, there was such a concentration of these chests in Sussex and nearby, uh, how come that the chest had found its way, uh, or had it found its way from the south to Nottinghamshire? And it seemed to have similar decoration uh, in broad terms to the chest in the south. So uh, we asked Martin uh, and Dan to do a dating of this, uh, and the result came that uh, the chest was most likely to have been made in Sussex, Hampshire, and Surrey. And if you look at this uh, map, the, the largest uh, green discs show a T value of six and a half or great or greater. That's considered to be a, a very decent level of matching. And you can see, well, there's a match with Dover. Well, in Dover Castle wasn't built with uh, only uh, timber from uh, from Kent it was also bought, built with timber from further west in Kent and Sussex, and also from Colchester. Uh, but the 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 big discs in uh, Hampshire, Somerset, uh, uh, and uh, Wiltshire suggest a sort of cluster. Now you can see where Lincoln is. Uh, it's a long way north. And it seems to be in a desert in terms of uh, T values. Well, there is a problem with this because, uh, as I said, you can only uh, make a comparison with a chronology uh, if one has been taken. 
So what we don't know from this map, and Martin will probably tell us in the discussion, is whether there are a lot of uh, chronology for the area of Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, uh, Nottinghamshire, uh, <clears throat> that potentially could have given a match, uh, or whether there is a sort of problem of a, a desert in terms of uh, sampling. But clearly, there, there has been a lot more sampling in the site, so that tends to uh, give a slight uh, bias to the potential uh, chronology that exists. But I think from this, one has to conclude that it's um, more plausible uh, that the chest, the laying chest, was actually made rather close to the, uh, the places where uh, these chests are found today. So this is the sort of surprise that can uh, one that can emerge from gender chronology. Uh, <clears throat> Chris, sorry to interrupt. Can I draw your attention to the time we are overrunning? Uh, and due to commence our second afternoon paper. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, I'll be very, very quick then. Uh, right, the, uh, just a word about the, uh, the uses of these chests. I wanted to ask whether these could have been used for vestments. I took the, the typical size of vestment from the Opus Sanguitanum book. Probably many of you saw the exhibition. The coat, 150 centimeters long, Chassouble 120. I'd add five centimeters for uh, putting it in. And what emerges is that of the Sussex chest, six out of 11 were big enough for the coat, 10 out of 11 were big enough for Chassouble in the bottom two uh, rows there. Uh, in, if you take all the chests with roundels, because I thought to myself, well, could round, having a roundel mean this is a vestment chest? Um, six, six out of 11 with Randalls, including these outliers, uh, non Sussex ones. Six out of 11 were big enough. Nine out of 11 were big enough for the 120 centimeter ones. Uh, so again, one can't say that Randalls are synonymous with big enough to have vestments. What do Randalls mean? Well, today in vernacular architecture, they're usually given the apotropaic meaning. Personally, I think uh, it's really quite premature to give a, a meaning to these uh, these symbols, if they are symbols. They could either mean nothing at all. Uh, they could mean a constant meaning. They could mean a varying meaning. The, the advocate of that they don't mean, mean anything is Jean Cousinier, who's a, a French anthropologist, who says they simply record the spread of the compass. Uh, that's perhaps taking, pushing it a bit far, but you can see that there can be many interpretations. I'm not uh, going for any particular one. Uh, is there any evolution over time? Well, what I, I'd ask you to compare those two. What I'd suggest the the uh, the, uh, the uh, these are the uh, simple ones are on the earlier dated chests, and what I suspect, although we haven't actually got down to any of the ones with complex uh, roundels is that they are from the later chess. And by later, I, I suspect 1300s, 1330s, likely. And the final question I need to ask is uh, who commissioned them? Well, my feeling is uh, a lot can be, a lot can be inferred from two, two pictures. If you look at this uh, map, this is agricultural land value land value. You can see that uh, North East Kent and uh, West Sussex are heavily coincidental with high value land. And I, I don't want to be too materialist about this, but uh, clearly you had wealthy farmers, you had churches and cathedrals which were uh, had wealthy estates. And it seems to be these are precisely the sort of area where you would expect uh, wealth to be translated Go through a series of intermediaries, probably gifts being involved uh, into uh, objects for churches. And uh, finally, just to reinforce that, that that's the uh, a map 1290 population distribution from uh, Campbell's book. And again, you can see that the uh, population density is 
the model here would be uh, populations settling in wealthier areas uh, and creating economic growth. And I think that tends to support that general picture. But clearly that there's much more to do about uh, finding the actual channels by which these emerge. And uh, unfortunately, the documentation doesn't tell you whether uh, how a chest is decorated. Chris, thank you. I, I think you've you've uh, drawn things very nicely to an end in that extremely wide ranging uh, survey. Um, and we look forward to your forthcoming article. Um, can I just say, please, uh, to the